What's going on everyone, Ronan here, and welcome back to the channel. We got a lot to cover in today's part, but before we get into that, there's a couple of things we gotta take care of first. Let's shout out the patron, Johnny. Thank you very much for your continued support. And also, everyone, analytics are very important. So, I need you guys to be as engaged with the videos as possible. So, while you're here, drop a like, drop a comment, and don't forget to subscribe and turn on notifications, so that way you'll never miss another upload from the channel. But with all of that being said, let's get into what if Ash won the Hoenn League, part eight. I hope you enjoy. With the events of Farina and the ominous warning of Butler now behind them, our heroes find themselves arriving in their next destination of Rubello Town. The reason for this is a simple one. This is the site of the next contest, which has both May and Ash excited. They can both taste the victory and intend to get it at any cost. However, this isn't the only thing that is going on, as Max is still dealing with the effects of what happened with Jirachi. The boy has receded it into himself, saying nothing during the whole trip here. And this leaves May in a predicament, as she's still furious with Max and how he's been acting as of late, but at the same time, she can't help but to feel sorry for the boy. So, this is dividing her attention, as she also has to prepare for the contest, which is in two days' time. The Pokemon Center is a bustle with many coordinators readying for the competition, so while Max secludes himself in the group's room at the center, May pushes him out of her thoughts so she can continue to practice. She is determined to get her second ribbon at any cost, so she asks Brock if he will look after Max for the next couple of days. She's going to head into the forest and train, and she won't be back till the night before the contest. Brock doesn't have any issue with this due to his history with his siblings, so after telling him that she owes him, May sets off on her own training. This leaves Ash, who we find outside of the Pokemon Center. He's got a lot of work to do, as the contest is in two days. So, for the first order of business, our hero sends out all of their Pokemon so that way they can get a chance to know his newest catch, Vibrava. Mawile is already familiar with the dragon, so this is old news to it and Pikachu. But Slackoth and Feebas show great interest in the new Pokemon as it is revealed that Vibrava has a mischievous personality using its wings to beat a supersonic frequency that only Pokemon can hear, causing them to all writhe in pain. That is all except for Slackoth, as its perception of pain is far different than any of the others as it embraces the dragon with a hug. However, this leaves the ace of Ash's Hoenn roster, Grovile, who won't stand for this pointless expression of self. The Wood Gecko uses its high threshold for pain to push through and threaten Vibrava with a Fury Cutter. The Dragon type sees this and uses its obviously superior speed to dodge Grovile by taking to the skies above. This causes the Grass type to grow angered as Vibrava hovers above laughing as it thinks the whole exchange is funny. Ash can see this isn't going to end well as Grovile uses its superior jumping ability to give chase to Vibrava, to which it quickly takes off thinking it's a game. Ash tells the two to stop. They shouldn't be fighting each other, but this command falls on deaf ears as his Dragon is able to stay just ahead of Grovile causing its rage to build with each missed attack. It gets to the point that Grovile shifts from a point of establishing Vibrava's place in the pecking order to attack with the intent to harm. The dragon is oblivious to this and realizes this too late as Grovile uses its superior power to trap the dragon in a rock tomb. It's at this moment things set in for the dragon as Grovile doesn't hesitate to hit it with a fury cutter that is so strong it breaks the rock prison and slashes it across the belly sending the dragon into a tree behind it. As Vibrava looks up at Grovile, the grass type gives it a look that says, Watch where you step, cause it may be your last. This is where Ash steps in, telling Grovile to stop. They are supposed to be on the same team, so they shouldn't be fighting each other. The grass type just looks at Ash before divinely taking off to the opposite side of the clearing for training at the river that contains massive boulders. Ash looks at Grovile with a little bit of disgust before turning to Vibrava, asking if it's alright. The dragon type nods, though it's clear from the flinch that it is in a little bit of pain. Ash apologizes for Grovile, telling Vibrava that he understands it may have thought that this was a little prank and it was funny but it should probably take caution as it was a little extreme, even for him. Vibrava thinks about what Ash is saying as the boy explains it is part of something bigger now, and the dragon has to think about more than just itself. The whole time Ash is looking at Grovile as it continues the train. The wood gecko hears Ash, but thinks this whole notion of team togetherness is foolish. It's clear that it is the strongest one of the team, and the way the grass type sees it, strength is the only thing that matters. So this newcomer needs to respect the hierarchy. If it doesn't, well then, Grovile has no problem putting it in its place as the wood gecko charges another blade to slice a rock in front of it in half. With things kind of calm for the time being, Ash starts a training regimen that favors the style of how he won his first ribbon. While some like Pikachu, Feebas, and Vibrava
by Rava have no issue with this training as it favors their preferred style of battling. Mawile and Slackoth have trouble as Mawile keeps diverting from the plan trying to show off by adding special moves like spins and landings, while Slackoth just lacks any type of ability of urgency favoring a more laid back approach. This causes Ash to lose faith in those two, declaring that since they can't really get in with the training, he's going to let them sit this contest out. Hopefully they will get it by the next one. While Slackoth doesn't have any issue with this as it's just happy to be included, Mawile on the other hand is devastated by this news as it's been looking forward to the next contest. This completely kills the motivation it had to train, so the Steel type decides to sit this one out, a bit upset that Ash isn't willing to give it a chance. This pattern continues over the rest of the day and into the next as Ash continues his training all the way up to the night before the contest. This just leaves Brock and what he's been doing the whole time May and Ash have been training. Well, he has managed to get Max out of bed, though the boy refuses to say anything. So to combat this, Brock is the one who talks. He asks Max to help him with something, informing the boy that he won't have to talk, just help him sort out some berries as Brock is looking to start producing a new style of Pokeblock, but not just any Pokeblock, one that is unlike anyone has ever seen before. So the two head over to the Pokeblock machine. This is where Brock opens up his bag to reveal that over the past couple of weeks, he's been gathering berries from everywhere that they have traveled in the Hoenn region. The amount the breeder has is staggering, even causing Max to finally open his mouth with a gasp of surprise. Brock explains that he hopes to put the final touches on his Pokeblock today so that May and Ash can have it for their contest. Once Max gets over the shock value, the two get to work with Max finally opening up to Brock as he wants to make sure that the berries he is handling are the right ones. As the two work, they talk as Brock doesn't really push the conversation in any way, letting it flow where Max is comfortable. The boy only really wants to talk about Brock's new Pokeblock and the process. Brock explains that the mixture is very sensitive and he's been practicing whenever he gets a chance and they're at a contest hall. Over the last few months, he's been refining the process more and more and he thinks that he may have finally solved the equation. It's at this moment that the machine beeps, signifying that the process is done. Brock then pulls out the block only for Max to comment that it looks like any other ordinary block. But the breeder explains that he's not done yet. This is where we have one more thing to do. Then Brock sends in Torkoal. He then puts the block in an airtight metal container before asking the fire turtle to start the process. Brock sets the container on the shell of his mon as Torkoal begins to slowly apply heat, then surprisingly smoke. Brock explains that he found the missing ingredient for the Pokeblock when they were in Farina. It's a berry that resists fire called the rawest berry. The idea is that its ability to resist heat should allow the Pokeblock's other ingredients to bond on a molecular level. If they can achieve that, then this Pokeblock would be able to bring out the dominant traits of a Pokemon, allowing them to reach their full potential. And in theory, if you apply this to the classes of contests or your Pokemon battle style, then you and your Pokemon should be able to achieve a level of teamwork that others could only dream of. It's here that Torkoal signals that the block should be done. Brock then grabs the container and opens it, but much to the disappointment of the breeder, the Ross Berry wasn't enough to prevent the heat treatment from turning the Pokeblock into charcoal. Brock sighs, as he really thought that he had it this time. Max is unsure of what to say here, as he begins to realize something from working with Brock. While he's been sulking in his own world, the others' lives haven't stopped, yet they have all been trying to understand what he is, was going through. Even May tried, only for the boy to turn her away. Max wants to ask Brock something, but is interrupted by an old man who tells them that he's been listening and watching the two since they started. He finds Brock's approach to making Pokeblock very interesting and thinks that he may be on the right track but is missing one key ingredient to bring it all together. Brock asks exactly what that is. He's researched all of the berries that appear in Hoenn and has managed to find all of them, but no matter the combination, the Pokeblock can't handle the heat. The old man asks if Brock has a list of all of the berries he's found, to which Brock, being one to document everything, hands over one that is listed by importance. Looking over the list, the berry master states that Brock has done well in his collection of data, but there is one that is missing, a berry so rare that it only grows in one place in all of Hoenn, a place that is said to be a mirage, so most consider it to be a myth. This triggers the breeder's interest, causing him to poke further trying to get the name of this elusive berry out of the crackpot old man. But this is far easier than Brock was intending, as the man easily gives up the name as the Enigma berry, because this berry is so rare, its properties and how it would affect Pokeblock are unknown, so it could be exactly what Brock needs to create his master block, the old man comes to call it. This is where Max points out that it may be the case that this berry could help in the process, but if it's considered to be a myth, then they might as well forget about it since they couldn't test this outlandish theory out anyway. However, the old man chuckles as he reaches into his rope. Max declares that he is uncomfortable with where this is heading, thinking that he may have just figured out where these enigma berries actually grow. The boy tells the old man to stop before he calls Officer Jenny, but just as he finishes the statement, the old man produces three berries that 
neither Brock nor the boy have ever seen before. I've had these for many years, the old man says. When I was young, I found myself in the seas of South Hoenn. One night, we became lost at sea, only to end up on a small island. This is where I discovered these berries. I had never seen anything like them before, and I figured if I could take enough to grow back on the mainland, then I could make a fortune. So I took nearly every berry on the island that it had to offer, only leaving enough for it to regrow whatever I had taken, just in case I needed to come back for more. But upon arriving back on the mainland, I discovered why they would only grow on the island, as every berry that I planted on my farm quickly died, and soon, after many failures, I was only left with these three. But I figured I could just return to the mysterious island and get more, as it had been years since my last visit, so they should have replenished by then. But it was not to be. As I set sail to find the magical place, I was only met with open water, unable to ever step foot on that paradise again. Now I'm an old man, with little left to my legacy. I spent years trying to combine berries to produce the effects of these berries, but to little success. So if I could help you unlock your master block, then I know my life wouldn't have been a waste. Brock asks if the berry master is sure that he would want to give up something like this, to which he replies that he's had them for over 50 years and done nothing with them. So it's time they were put to use. Brock takes the berries and thanks him. He then turns to Max and Torkoal, stating that they have some Pokeblock to make. The four spend the next two days working on the Pokeblock, combining the Enigma berry in three different ways. While the first two batches end in a result that is less than perfect, the last one is different, as there is a slight glow to the block when Brock pulls it out from the container post the heat treatment. The breeder can't explain it, but he knows that this is the right batch. Each attempt was closer than the last, resulting in three different batches of Pokeblock that had 12 pieces each. Wanting to test it out, Brock takes out one of the pieces from the lowest quality batch and gives it to Torkoal. Upon ingesting it, the fire type expels a burst of smoke, signaling that it likes it. But this isn't what has brought attention to the turtle. It's the smoke itself. It has a slight shimmer to it, and seems to be a bit cleaner than before. It's more gray than black. Wow, the berry master says, I knew these berries were good, but I didn't think they would be that good with lower quality Pokeblock. But a problem quickly becomes apparent as the smoke quickly turns black again, signaling that the lower level blocks, while great for the short term, is only temporary. So Brock will have to test them all out carefully as they have a limited supply. Over the next day, Brock continues to test the berries each on one of his Pokemon to document the effects. One thing is obvious, the ones that have the perfect mixture are the most potent, as their effects appear to be permanent, as when he tests one on Torkoal, its smoke changed from black to a very light, almost white gray, and does not revert. Knowing this is an incredible discovery, Brock tells Max that they need to keep this to themselves for the time being, as he's afraid that if May and Ash find out that there's an easy way to get the most out of their Pokemon, then it would affect their training and attitudes towards the situation. Plus, they don't know if there is any negative side effects from this Pokeblock, so he will be monitoring Torkoal closely for the next few weeks. Max agrees, as he really doesn't have anything to say to Ash or his sister anyway, both for different reasons. As a thank you to the old Berry Master, Brock gifts him with three of the Pokeblock to replace the berries that he gave him. The old man then has one more thing for Brock, as he hands over a map that has the general area that the old man thinks he found the island. If Brock is ever in that area, then he should try to find it, as the berries on the island are special, and the old man wants to make sure that he didn't cause the island to become barren. Brock nods as we fade to the night before the contest and the group all meet up in the lobby of the Pokemon Center. May looks like she has been through the ringer as she feels that she may have a new secret weapon for tomorrow's contest. While Ash on the other hand feels like his training was the exact opposite. It feels like most of his team are all on opposite pages and this has severely limited his options for the contest. But nonetheless, he feels that they are the best ones to go with and that his strategy is going to win, no doubt. This is where we see a familiar face as Harley joins the group, specifically making fun of May for her disheveled look. If that's the way you keep yourself, then your Pokemon are developing horrible practices and there's no way you will ever make it past the first round tomorrow, the green clad man says. However, Harley finds that his comments have fallen on deaf ears, as May is ignoring him in favor of talking with another contestant for tomorrow's competition, a woman by the name of Savannah and her daughter Sandra, who May met while she was in training. Let's just say there is a reason May has a new strategy. This gets under Harley's skin as he stomps off in frustration at his inability to cause May any of her own frustration. This is where we see another familiar face in Drew as he sits quietly in the corner of the center, really watching everyone. He has overheard everything that May and Ash have said about their secret winning strategies, and the only thing he can think to himself is that one of these two is the most pathetic attempt at a coordinator he's ever seen. This leads us into the next day, as the contest hall is abuzz with many coordinators and audience members. The pressure is on for all as they need to show something that the crowd has never seen before. This is where we lead into the 
the first rounds. Savannah is up first as she uses her Flareon to dazzle the crowd with its fire type attacks. But this is a smart contest and she has to do something to show off the cunning of her Pokemon. However, this is a simple task as when executing a fire blast, Savannah does what seems to be a fatal mistake to her contest run when Flareon ends up in the direct path of the attack, only to reveal that its ability Flash Fire kicks in, allowing it to absorb the attack, causing it to glow in an intense red aura. With this demonstration of Savannah's talents, things move forward with Drew earning his spot with his Masquerin. Harley clenches his spot with Spinda and May uses Beautifly to earn her top spot. This just comes down to Ash being the last one in the contest which he knows he can ace this choosing to send in Pikachu. While the electric mouse proves that it has great power, the demonstration round doesn't go too well for Ash as he only embraces his headstrong brute force style of battling. Brock has come to notice this and it is no surprise to the breeder that Ash has come to be excluded from the next round. Brock is curious to what Ash has been thinking as of late. It seems when he's in Pokemon battles there is no problem with his style of battling, even demonstrating his ability to adapt on the fly to new situations. But when it comes to contests, Ash just only chooses one style. It's unlike the boy, so Brock is going to keep an eye on him for now. This leads us up to the point before the top four is to start. When we find Ash in the locker room, cheering on May in her battle as she takes to the stage, Ash's cheers are interrupted by Drew as he approaches the boy, asking why Ash is here. Our hero responds that he was in the competition, so he is allowed back here. But that's not what Drew meant. He means why is Ash continuing this facade of pretending to be a coordinator? Every time Ash has been in a contest with Drew, the results have been pathetic. This gets the boy mad and he reminds Drew that he won a ribbon in the super contest. So Drew doesn't know what he's talking about, but the verdant hair boy sticks to his guns, saying it's the only ribbon that Ash has won. And with each contest he enters, it's more pathetic than the last as Ash shows no evolutions to his technique. It's the same thing, Ash forcing his Pokemon to work against their natures, confusing them in the process. It's the worst example of someone trying to be something they're not that Drew has ever seen. His Pokemon have the ability to be great, as everyone that Drew has seen has the potential to go far in contests, but they are all held back by their novice trainer trying to be a coordinator. This leaves Ash speechless as Drew walks away, telling him to give up and stick to gym battles. At least there, he won't embarrass himself. This is where we fade to the battle area to reveal why May was so confident in her newest strategy, as the Pokemon we see her battling with against Savannah and her Laron is her newly evolved Combuskin. The Firestarter had evolved in training that May was doing, and the reason she met Savannah is because Torchic had learned a new move in Fire Spin, causing it to evolve. But the fire attack went a little crazy. Luckily, Savannah and her Flareon were nearby and helped control the blaze. This is where we find the two in the middle of the final seconds of the battle as the two trade their final blows, with May playing it smart, using Combuskin's legs and its new fighting type to her advantage to push back an Iron Tail before roasting Laron with the Fire Spin that brings the battle to a close, moving May to the finals. This leaves Harley and Drew's next battle, but there is little the green suited man could have done as his choice for the final round wasn't the best he could have made with the ghost type Bayonet, but Drew was thinking three steps ahead as he unveiled his newest contest Pokemon known as Absol. Drew reveals here why he is considered to be a prodigy in the contest scene as Absol makes quick work using its typing here to embrace the spirit of contests and just overwhelm Bayonet, knocking it out with the faint attack as the ghost type couldn't track the dark type when it had stacked flashes earlier in the battle. This leads us to the finals as Drew and May stand across from each other. The two say nothing, both confident in their victory here, but May is feeling very confident as having seen the last battle with Harley, she has chosen to copy Drew's strategy and use Combuskin's typing to her advantage. However, she is quickly going to find out that she overlooked one key factor of the last battle, the usage of Flash on Drew's part to which he implements in this battle from the start. This makes it very hard for Combuskin to keep up with the dark type. Then things become even worse when Drew actually starts attacking as with the heightened evasion of Absol it allows the disaster Pokemon to draw the fire type in close, dodging the attack and then landing their secret move, a water pulse. The power of this move is enough to cause a major difference in their points. This forces May into a position that no coordinator wants to find themselves in and that is playing catch up. Unfortunately, it's too late as time is counting down with only seconds left on the clock until the battle is called and Drew is declared the winner. After the festivities have come to an end, May stops Drew on the way out to congratulate him on his win of his fourth ribbon. The boy turns, telling May that
that it was smart to mimic his strategy. She had been catching on to things as a coordinator, unlike that trainer Ash. He will never be someone that understands the beauty of battles like we do. But you, if you keep pushing, then I may even call you a rival one day. Drew then leaves May, a bit unsure on how to take what was just said, as Drew just complimented her but put Ash down. Unsure of what else to do, she rejoins her friends at the Pokemon Center. But things seem a little off. Not only is Max not speaking to anyone, but Ash is unusually quiet. May asks Brock what the deal is with Ash, but the breeder says he doesn't know. Ash has been like this since the end of the battle with Savannah. May attempts to talk with Ash, but the boy says he's fine. It's just been a long day, and they have to get an early start, so he just wants to relax before they head out in the morning. Okay, May says, a bit concerned, leaving the issue alone for now. The next day, our heroes set out bright and early. While Ash seems to be back to normal, as he and Pikachu devoured anything that was put in front of them at breakfast, both May and Brock can't help but to feel that something is off, as over the next week that it takes for them to get to Fortree City, while Ash and May are training, Ash is a bit different with all of his Pokemon. His approach seems hands-off, letting them kind of do their own thing while he watches. For Grovile, this is perfect, as the starter is left alone for his own ways of training, while Ash is not hanging over his shoulder, telling the Wood Gecko that it trains too much and could hurt itself. This is a good thing, as Grovile can feel that it is on the verge of unlocking something new. Ash's other Pokemon, while concerned, don't find this too odd, as they haven't been with Ash too long, so this could just be one of his ways of training for all they know. But the one that is most concerned is Pikachu, as it was there for the conversations with Drew. It knows why Ash is acting the way he is, but isn't sure on how it can help the boy. But this is also noticed by both May and Brock, as over the week, Ash just sits, watching his Pokemon practice. But Brock begins to notice something. Ash isn't just staring into space like they had originally thought. He's actually watching his Pokemon, like he was looking for something. But what the breeder doesn't know, as when asked about it, Ash feigns ignorance and changes the subject. This leads us to the day that they arrived at the site of his next battle in Fortree City. While Ash isn't his normal excited self, he does give off an aura that says he's ready for his next battle, like it's something he needs to validate something. With this in mind, the group passes the Pokemon Center and heads straight to the gym. However, when they arrive, Ash finds out that his gym battle is going to have to wait, as the gym leader isn't here for the week as she is to host something called the Feather Carnival, an event that happens in Fortree City once a year. So like it or not, Ash is going to have to wait until the festival is over before he can get his gym battle. But our hero isn't going to take this lying down, as he tells everyone they are going to the festival to find the gym leader so that way he can get his battle. Brock advises Ash to just wait as they have been traveling for a while, so it could be good just to unwind and take it easy. But the boy won't take no for an answer, so he heads off into town, leaving the rest of his friends stumbling to catch up. However, it's here that Ash is going to find out his mission may be next to impossible, as for such a small town, this carnival has a lot of people in it. Wow, Brock says, I wasn't expecting this. The carnival must be a big deal. May seconds this, with Max just looking around as everything here reminds him of Jirachi, making the whole situation very uncomfortable. Brock notices this, telling May and Ash that he and Max are going to head back to the Pokemon Center and get a room, if there is still any left. So, the team splits up, with Max thanking Brock for getting him out of there. He's not ready for something like that yet. Brock says no problem. They will just hang out at the center and work on the master block and document its effects on his Pokemon. This leaves May and Ash as they get separated in a huge crowd. But for Ash, this doesn't matter, as he is on a mission. However, for May, this is a big deal. As she makes her way through the crowd, she comes across a vendor that claims to be selling a Pokemon called Chimeco. May calls this into question when it's revealed to be a Pokemon called Hopip that the vendor painted so that way he can make a profit from selling what is supposed to be a rare Pokemon in the region of Hoenn. As she exposes the vendor, this causes a small riot that forces the vendor to abandon ship as he is run out of town being chased by the unhappy mob as it appears that the Chimeco is a highly desired Pokemon. This is when she notices what is perceived to be one of the Hoppet painted to be looking like a Chimeco hiding behind some vendor stands. She approaches it telling the grass type that it is free to go so it can fly away. But the Mon refuses to go, seemingly hiding trying to avoid the crowd by attempting to go in May's traveling bag. This action triggers her Pokedex which gives off some surprising information. This is actually a Chimeco. Realizing that this is a chance of a lifetime and the psychic type refuses to leave May's side, she pulls out a Pokeball and taps it on the head. With no resistance at all, May captures Chimeco, adding it to her team. It's good she did so, as the angry crowd has returned, and if they could find out that there was a wild Chimeco around here after they were sold some fake ones, things might get a little hairy. So the girl rushes, trying to get back to the Pokemon Center, but this is where she runs into a familiar face, bumping into the coordinator Grace. May asks her what she is doing here. This question 
even surprises the coordinator as she thought that Mei would be here for the same reason she is. With a laugh, Grace tells Mei that there is a contest here. The Feather Carnival is over the course of a week's time, and one of the things people get to do when they take part in it is the forgery contest. This causes the girl to panic. She didn't know and wants a chance to enter. Mei asks to where the registration is, to which the girl points to a giant tent in the middle of the carnival grounds. But before she can say anything, Mei takes off in the direction in hopes of registering before it's closed. It's here that she runs into Ash, who has been unable to find the city's gym leader. Mei tells him that there is a contest, so they should hurry. If he can't get a battle till the end of the week, then this would be great for practice until then. At first, our hero is hesitant, but Mei doesn't give him a chance to decline. As she is so impatient, she grabs Ash's hand and pulls him in the direction of the tent. Moments later, they find themselves at the registration counter, just barely missing out on the cutoff. Mei is the first one to enter, to which she finds out that this is a beautiful style contest. This excites her, as she thinks that there is a perfect Pokemon in her arsenal to use for the win. However, Ash is hesitant to enter and doesn't really want to. That is, until a person addresses someone behind the counter as Winona, asking if she will be having any gym battles this week. The girl says she doesn't, as she is the master of ceremonies, so her full attention has to be on the carnival. This gets Ash's attention, as he rushes Winona, asking if she's really the gym leader, to which she confirms. Ash then insists that they have a gym battle, so that way he can get his next badge. But this time, the way he says it has a hint of desperation behind it, like this is something Ash needs, and if he doesn't get it, then something bad will happen. The boy is downright pushy at this request, but when Nona is in a pushover, as she explains, there will be no gym battles until after the carnival is over. Ash will have to wait until then, but the boy persists, urging Winona to have a battle with him. However, the gym leader, now a bit irritated at Ash's inability to take no for an answer, stands firm, telling Ash she will not, and if he continues to bother her about it, then she won't accept his challenge. This causes the boy to stop his pestering as May knocks him in the head, telling Ash to just enter the contest for now. Then, he can have the gym battle later. Realizing that he won't get his way here, Ash reluctantly enters. He turns to Winona, telling her that she should come by the contest. She might see the Pokemon that will hand her her next loss in the gym challenge. May hears this remark from Ash and is a bit surprised. She wonders what's up with him. As the boy walks off, May apologizes for him before giving chase, telling Ash to wait up. All the while, Winona looks on, wondering about this boy. As May catches up, she asks what that was all about, but Ash simply tells her to mind her own business. He has to prepare for tomorrow's contest. This leaves May standing in the crowd, wondering what her next move is. Later that night at the center, May explains to Brock what happened with Ash today and how they are having a contest tomorrow. While Brock does agree it's strange, they have to let Ash come to them. It seems that he's going through something right now. If we force the situation, then he will be less likely to want to share anything with us. So let's just be here when he needs us, but continue with things as usual. With a sigh, May then asks about Max, to which Brock says not to worry. He will watch him while she is in the contest. Thanks, she says. As we fade to outside the center with Ash sitting on a rock doing the same thing that he has been, watching all of his Pokemon like a hawk, like he's looking for something. Pikachu sits with the trainer as the rest of the night fades on and we move into the following morning. As May and Ash leave, Brock waves them off, wishing them luck. It's here that Max appears, asking if they are gone. Brock says they are, but Max can't continue to avoid them forever. The boy says he knows, but he just doesn't know how to talk with May after everything he's done. Plus, she doesn't get what I'm going through with everything that happened in Farina. Brock reminds Max that they haven't really talked, so there's no way he can know that for sure, but that's for a later time. Brock then sends out all of his Pokemon and asks if Max is ready to get to work. This gets him to perk up a bit as the duo head behind the Pokemon Center to begin testing the effects of the Master Block. Now we flash over to the Carnival Tent as the contest festivities have begun. Ash told May that he would like them to remain separate for the contest so he can focus, to which after the conversation with Brock the previous night, she has no problem with as she has her own things to worry about as she didn't really have any time to prepare for this contest, but she still feels more confident than the last one. This is where we find out that the host of the contest is none other than Winona. Ash realizes what he said yesterday may come back to bite him as the gym leader is going to get a really good look at his Pokemon that he has chosen today. From here, things pick up quickly as the demonstration round gets underway. Grace is the first to enter as she uses her dust stocks to secure her spot in the next round with moves like silver wind and light screen to cause a reflection that highlights the bug type of her mon. This is followed suit by May as she has decided to use Beautifly that demonstrates its mastery of stun spore with silver wind to create a shimmering tornado that it breaks when using gust to really highlight its wings and the power that it emanates with them. However, the next contestant refuses to be outdone as Harley has made his way to this contest looking for some redemption against May for the humiliating he suffered in the prior contest and 
almost like he is following the example of the previous two, Harley unveils his newest contest companion in a bug type known as Aria Dose. It is able to use moves like Spider's Web and Shadow Ball to show off the dark side of beauty, securing his spot in the first round of battles. And this brings us to Ash, who is the second to last contestant. For the first time in a contest, he is nervous and he can feel his legs shaking uncontrollably. But as he takes the stage, he focuses on the goal to get past the first round. Mawile, I choose you. As the steel type pops from the ball, Mawile takes to the stage in what could be considered its trademark entrance as it uses the secondary mouth it has as a platform to launch itself airborne in an elegant manner before gracefully landing with a bow. This captures the attention of the judges and the crowd as it's clear this Pokemon has a knack for performance. It's here that we see what exactly Ash has been watching and what ultimately made him choose Mawile as their demonstration begins and Mawile uses a sandstorm out of all moves. But it's not a full-on attack causing a dust cloud. Mawile uses it as an extension of itself, dancing around on the stage as the sand whips from its limbs to help highlight its already elegant movements. However, something is of note here as Ash isn't giving Mawile any commands. The steel type is moving completely on its own, which has the judges stunned at how graceful it is without the help of its coordinator. At the end of their time, Ash is able to advance to the battle rounds as Mawile gets a standing ovation from the crowd and the judges for its performance, which brings untold joy to the Metal Princess. However, there is one thing here that isn't swayed by Ash's Pokemon, and that is Winona, as she merely watches, still forming an opinion on the matter. As the battle rounds start, it doesn't take long to figure out who is going to be moving on to the third round, with Harley easily winning with his Wigglytuff, May squeezing out a win with Saviper, Grace uses another new Pokemon to her roster in Zankus, and Ash is barely able to take the next battle by using a surprise entrant of Feebas. However, this is where things start to change as Ash is paired with Grace for his top 4 battle. Unfortunately for the boy, he stands no chance here as Feebas, while tough, lacks the elegance to pull off a win as it first loses massive points when Zangoose uses a Crush Claw to counter its double edge. Then it's knocked out in its entirety when Feebas' limited move pool costs it as the fish is unable to defend against a Thunder Punch, knocking it and Ash out of the contest for good. This brings us to the battle with Harley and May. Wigglytuff proves to be a powerful opponent for May and Saviper as its ability to inflate itself to repel the attacks comes into play, costing May points. It looks like Harley is going to win this one, gloating about it, saying this is what she deserves for the last contest, but he really hasn't been paying attention to the Serpent's attack patterns, as May had planned to lose those points to feel out Wigglytuff. As the normal type tried to close this out with a focus punch, a simple command of Haze causes the attack to miss, allowing Saviper to land a poison tail for the win. With May and Grace moving on to the finals, Harley and more importantly Ash are left to lick their wounds. Ash watches as May struggles to combat Zangoose as it appears to have the perfect counter to Zaviper. After all, they are blood enemies. However, May is beginning to see a path to victory emerging as Zaviper's attacks patterns is the problem here. So she orders it to coil up instead of striking. Doing as she commands, the snake begins to make a new move as the coiling causes it to spin like a top of sorts. Instead of using its fangs as a striking mechanism, Zaviper relies on its tail that it can slingshot in a wider point of attack, slicing at Zangoose like a sword. This creativity in battle allows May to pull ahead as Grace's attack patterns are now useless. This results in May being able to clutch out a win here with her serpent, earning her the second ribbon of the Grand Festival. With the contest now at an end, we move over to the locker area where Ash is sitting, seemingly more down than when they were at the last contest. This is where May and Winona walk in as the leader is curious to how May came up with that type of attack. The girl says her friend, the one that had challenged her, often does things like that, so she just does things how he would, but the conversation is stopped midway when the two lay eyes on Ash. The girl can instantly see something is wrong, and she knows that Brock told her to leave it alone, but May can't help herself in asking after all the time she just spent hyping Ash up to Winona. At first, Ash refuses to give up anything, but May is persistent and Winona urges him to talk. It's the only way his friends can help. Looking at his starter, Ash explains the conversation that he had with Drew. Then, all the things that have been going on with Grovile and how poorly he's been doing in contests lately. Everything is beginning to add up and it feels like no matter what he does, he can't gain any traction. Ash feels like he's losing his edge as a trainer, so Ash decided to try and do what Drew said and he spent time studying his Pokemon. He thought he had it figured out, but as soon as he faced a competent trainer, he lost. Now he doesn't know what to do. That's why he hounded Winona for a battle, so he could break his losing streak that he's been on as of late, as he refuses to admit Drew was white. Can't be. May slaps Ash in the back of the head for the umpteenth time, telling him that Drew 
Saru was right. Ash has been riding high from his win in the tough class back in Fall Arbor Town, so he keeps approaching each contest the same way, which May didn't think she would have to point out to Ash of all people. But you can't do that. Each contest is different, meant to test your adaptability, which Ash has not been doing. Your Pokemon all have different personalities, Ash, each one opposite the next. It's up to you to embrace them and bring out their best qualities, just like in a Pokemon battle. The only one you've done that with as of late is Pikachu. Your other Pokemon have been left to their own devices and it's causing them to grow weaker as a result. This whole speech has Ash thinking about every moment of his journey in Hoenn up until this point. But just when he thinks he's done getting a lecture, Winona decides to throw in her two cents, explaining to Ash one simple truth. If everything that May said is true, then there's no point in them having a Pokemon battle, as he won't win. It will be a clean sweep on her part. This comment gets to Ash. There's no way he would lose a battle that bad. He's a seasoned trainer, and he wouldn't make a rookie mistake like that. Winona can see the conviction behind this statement, so she tells Ash to meet her at the gym in one hour. He will get the battle that he so desperately needs, and she hopes he will prove her wrong. Winona then walks away, leaving Ash and May standing there. Come on, Pikachu, we need to go. Our fourth badge awaits us. But May tries to stop the boy, telling him that Winona has a point. He should wait and work with his Pokemon so that way they can get back on the same page. But Ash just ignores her. After all, what does she know? May isn't as experienced as he is. As Ash walks off to get his fourth gym badge, May rushes to the Pokemon Center, informing Brock of what's going on. She tells him that Ash is going in battling blind, acting out of desperation. Realizing things are worse than he and May originally thought, all of them take off for the Fortree Gym. However, as they arrive, the predictions of Winona seem to ring true, as when they enter, the last thing they see is Pikachu being flash frozen with an ice beam from Winona's ace, Altaria. Then, to end the mouse, it is hit with a super effective earthquake. As May and Brock look on, May can see what Winona said was true. The scoreboard above shows that Altaria took out not only Pikachu, but Grovile and Vibrava. Ash hangs his head as he walks out to the battlefield, getting up his starter, and without a word, he leaves the gym, with his friends standing there, unsure of what to do next. And this is where we are going to leave things for now. So tell me, how did you feel about this part? Do you like the double contest and the way May got her second ribbon? What about the master block that Max and Brock are developing? Do you think it will help? or hurt our heroes. And what about Ash? He seems to be on a downward spiral with his recent run of bad luck. Or is it because the Pokemon he has are too much to handle? I don't think he's ever had such a diverse mixture of personalities in any form of media, and I'm really excited for what comes in the next few parts. Let me know your thoughts in the comments down below. And that's all we had for today's video. I really appreciate you guys stopping by to watch all the way to the end. And I just wanted to say thank you for that. If you guys really enjoy my content, consider following me on some of my other platforms like Discord, where you can get to know other people who are interested in what ifs, or on Twitter, where I post sometimes behind the scenes updates. Or if you want to help the channel grow a little bit extra, why don't you consider donating like the people right here have? As whatever you could offer could help us get to a larger audience by helping us get new videos done, or some of the projects that we more custom art is getting kind of expensive. So we want to make sure that we have the funds to do that. But with all that being said, I really hope you guys enjoyed everything and I will see you in the next video.